Evening, friends. It is once again I have the delight and sheer pleasure to have the opportunity to come with in, with on the uh, Awesome God Radio to share with you again on the Just Words Show. <clears throat> I am so excited about the opportunity. You see, I love to uh, to get the Word of God. I love to learn. I love to 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 get the Word of God. At the same time, I love to share. The word of God, things that I learn from the word. I love to share it. I, I love to let folks know those of you who want to grow in the word of God, not grow in a bunch of quips and quotations and a bunch of slick and cool sayings, but the word of God. <clears throat> then this is the place to be. If you have a friend, if you have a colleague, a co-worker, a neighbor who loves the word of God, then send them right here. Because this is where we discuss the word of God. That's the reason why we call it the just word show. Because it's just word. We try not to do a lot of opinion. We try not to do a lot of, uh, you know, conventional wisdom. You know, we try not to do a lot of that stuff because oftentimes conventional wisdom is not as wise as the word of God. In, in fact, every time conventional wisdom is not as wise as the word of God. Listen, friends, <clears throat> the greatest authority in the world on any topic is always the word. But let's take that even a step further. The great, and I want to say this to anyone who's listening, I don't care what you do in the body of Christ. I don't care if you play music. I don't care if you're the janitor mm -hmm. or the sexton. I don't care if you're a priest. I don't care if you're a cardinal. I don't care if you're a bishop. I don't care if you're a deacon. I don't care if you're an elder. I don't care if you're a reverend or a good reverend or whatever title you have or minister. <clears throat> the final authority in the church is never a person. It is always the word of God. And every person must submit to what the word says. Mm -hmm. Because this is the final authority. And it is what God has said on any topic that it addresses. So... That's why I always encourage folks to memorize portions of it. I encourage folks all the time to read it all the way through from cover to cover. I don't mean jump a little little chapter here, jump a chapter there, jump a chapter here, jump a chapter there. I, that's not what I mean. Mm -hmm. I mean Genesis 1-1. All the way through to Revelation chapter 21. I mean you have to read the whole thing. That way everything that you learn is kept in its context. It's kept in its proper literary context. And it's kept in its proper historic context. You can take any passage out of its context and make it say anything you want it to say. But what I want you to do, friends, and I want you to learn how to read it all the way through and memorize portions of it. Why? Because Psalm 119 makes it very clear. When I memorize scripture, when I hide it in my heart, it helps me to live a cleaner, God-fearing, God God-glorifying life. <clears throat> Listen, how can a young man clean his ways? This is also in the book of Psalms. How can a young man clean his ways? But by taking heed to the word of God. When you have a Christian who does not have clean ways, then that kind of tells you he's not in the word. I was speaking with a pastor this week, Pastor Emeka. His, his church is right there on the corner of uh, Old Court Road right next to the hospital and I was standing in his house he was telling me he said how do you know when a Christian does not have power because they don't have the word you want more power friends get more of the word you want to deal 
successfully with temptation, get more of the word. Jesus demonstrated that for us in Matthew chapter 4. He's quoting the word. The word for him, because the New Testament was not written, he was quoting from Deuteronomy. He was quoting from Psalm in one of those passages. He quoted Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 4. Every man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. Yes. Jesus quoted the word. He himself was the word. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't know that I can overstress that point enough. Many of the things that happen in our churches and that happen in our, our uh, you know, our Christian community would not happen if everyone stuck with the word. <clears throat> so I'm thankful for another chance to be here. Of course, my best friend is here with me tonight, who is my wife, the most beautiful woman that I know and, and the most beautiful woman and the only woman that I have ever uh, slept in the same bed with. And it's going to always be that way as long as we're both alive. Uh, praise right. God. Praise God. And um, so she's here to grace us this evening. She always sprinkles in some perspective. She always adds a, a tremendous point of view uh, with a flower attached to it. Mm. So uh, <laughs> she's going to be here with us tonight. She's going to be reading. She's going to be sharing uh, as the Lord shall guide her. <clears throat> but listen, friends. We've been talking for a few weeks now, about four weeks, about unity and love. We've been talking about unity, friends, and love. How much God loves unity. Yes. We even read passages two weeks ago. That there are six things that God hates. Mm -hmm. God hates disunity. And he absolutely loves it when his people come together in unity and love. Okay. We're going to deal with this tonight and we're going to deal with it next week. Tune in, friends, next week. I have been speaking with a very special friend of mine. If you've been following the Just Word show, you know my friend Justin Brown. He's been on the show twice now. He's going to be coming and sharing with me next week um, about, about unity and love and how we, our unity and our love need to transcend even our political differences. We can't be divided, friends, as believers in the body of Christ. By political differences You know some folks in the body of Christ Will vehemently debate And divide over Political ideology mm -hmm. Instead of letting The word of God be the final authority Even as it permeates The way that you vote mm -hmm. Particularly coming through this election season mm -hmm. I hope That as you looked at Things in your voting booth That you had your uh, Bible word glasses on such that it permeated your worldview and it affected the way that you voted. Not Democrat, not Republican, not ideology, mm -hmm. but word of God. Mm -hmm. He's going to be coming. We're going to talk about that next week. I have a series, a special series. We're planning in advance some special shows coming up. We're going to talk about in the next few weeks. I mean, you know, down the road a little bit more. My wife and I are preparing uh, to talk about the life of Samson. You don't want to miss that. Samson in the book of Judges. Um, so it was interesting that my wife and I had the opportunity to teach for a whole month on the book of Judges mm -hmm. at, our, at a church that we were attending at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a beautiful, beautiful time. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the book of Judges in a few weeks coming down the road, just particularly there something there about Samson that I want us to understand. Now, there are two more friends who have agreed to come on the show, and we're going to talk about why we, we, we talk about still love and unity in the body of Christ. We're going to close it out within the next two weeks or three weeks. My friends are coming on. 
and we're going to talk about listen friends it is a pink elephant issue it is a pink elephant elephant issue that many folks will not address and yet many hundreds of thousands of Christians are frustrated this is an issue of love it is an issue of unity it is a it is an issue of the word and we're going to talk about abusive churches and abusive church leaders if you know someone that's in that situation tell them two weeks from now to get ready to tune into the just word show you can share it with them on facebook you can tag them in it and you can call them on the phone and let them know awesome guard radio there's a guy that's going to talk about abusive churches and abusive church leaders we're going to say some things that you can't say you know or perhaps you may know someone who may not currently be um, in that particular situation, but they may have experienced it, um, and they're still struggling from some of that, you know, that baggage, that excess. Um, perhaps they haven't fully healed from that experience um, of being under that type of covering or leadership. So, uh, you know, encourage them to tune in um, so they can hear from a different perspective and hear from God's Word and from the men of God as they talk and teach about um, that type of culture, um, and how we get beyond the type of church culture that we've created that wasn't by God's design. No, it's not by God's design that leadership be ob- abusive, oppressive, insulting, condescending, hurtful. Uh, the house of God should be a hospital for the soul. Yes. Uh, could you, uh, you know, far be it from us to go to a hospital and then they damage us more once we get there, then we were and we leave hurt more. And, and you know, I, I witness the people and, and um, I, I share about the Lord and I got, you know, family members and friends and just people that I run across and I talk to them about the Lord. And, and um, you know, m- one of the things that, that grieves my heart and that I hear so often and I've heard dozens and dozens of times over the years is that, you know, the church. Is full of things that uh, that really don't glorify God. Mm-hmm. Full of hurtful situations, mm-hmm. and human traditions, human and, human <laughs> traditions, and yes. and things that I mean. I'm, but I'm that we sometimes hold in higher authority than God's word. Um, mm-hmm. You know these traditions that we think are on par with God's word. Um, and we really just corrupt the word, make trying to equate it with our human traditions that we feel um, are so reverential or so important. Mm-hmm. And um, some of us uh, in our churches, and I, I say this as have been having been a church leader for many years, and many of my friends are church leaders. Some of us have to, as pastors and church leaders, we need to kill some sacred cows. Mm-hmm. It's okay to let it go, particularly when it's holding your ministry back. Mm-hmm. And um, but anyway. Right, that's not our topic today. That, yeah, let, <laughs> I, I digress on that. Let's get to love. We want to talk about love. Let's start off with a passage in John chapter 13. Jesus himself is about to say something about love. John chapter 13, verses 34 and verse 35. What do you have there? Now listen, love, friends, love. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Okay, pause there. I know there's more to it. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Mm -hmm. A new command I give to you. He had taught them a lot up to this point. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself knew the law very well. His 12 disciples knew the law. We're talking about the law of Moses now very well because that was the only word or law that they had. 613 commandments. Most of them did not seem very loving. Mm -hmm. Now... They had the Tanakh, 
which is the writings, as we call the book of Proverbs, and some of the different parts of the Bible, the book of Job, we call them the writings, or as a Jewish person will call it in Hebrew, which, uh, you know, during the first century, before, the, before they had the Parashith, they had the Tanakh and the Torah. That's what, that was what they had. That was their Bible. Now, Jesus says, look, friends, I want to open something up for you. I'm going to share something with you. A new command I give to you. And I, friends, am commanding you to love each other. How? Do we love each other? Listen to what the word says. The way that I have loved you. <laughs> That's strong. That's strong. Now you got 12 men from multiple different backgrounds, different rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. Okay. Remember, you had some that were somewhat well-to-do. Some were skilled labor like fishermen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some were come from the good part of town. Some come from the bad part of town. And a couple of them were just cutthroats. And there was one that literally was a cutthroat because he was a Simon was a zealot. Mm -hmm. And the zealots were known as being very violent people who would literally run up to Romans and just cut their throats. So in that regard, I do mean he actually was a cutthroat, Simon the Zealot. But I also mean cutthroat from the standpoint of Judas Iscariot, who literally was scheming the whole time. Mm. But yet Jesus takes this dirty dozen, <laughs> if you will. I mean, he's trying to mold them mm -hmm. into some of the greatest preachers and church leaders to ever live. Folks that would give their lives for the cause of the kingdom. But before they get to that point in Acts chapter 2, mm -hmm. we're here a, a year earlier, approximately a year earlier in John chapter 13. Jesus is saying, a new commandment I give unto you. And I'm commanding you, brothers, it is pertinent and it is of yes. utmost importance, fellas, that you understand you got to love each other. And guess what? I don't even care what he did to you the other day. Mm. I don't care what he did to you last week. I don't care that he took your bread when you wasn't looking. And I don't care that you guys had an argument last week. And I don't care that you guys almost came to blows because you had a disagreement. Mm. But as I'm telling you right now, regardless of what happened in the past, and I don't care how you frustrated each other. Love each other. This is the command that God, that, excuse me, not, I mean, Jesus is giving to his, his disciples. The same way that I loved you. What, what else you got there? By this... By this will all men know that you are my disciples. Mm -hmm. In other words, they won't know that you're my disciples simply because you tell them that you were friends of mine. They won't know that you were my disciples because you tell them your name. Mm -hmm. They won't know that you're my disciples uh, because you tell them <laughs> that you're my disciples. But regardless of what you say or don't say, when folks run across you and your colleagues, they need to see a unique, stand out like a sore thumb type of love yes. that identifies that there's something special about this group. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
the mark of discipleship. It's, it's funny, as you were talking, I was sitting here thinking about how sometimes we, we draw lines. We draw two lines, imaginary lines, if you will, about who we will love uh, wholeheartedly and who we will be tempted to kind of cast into a role of less loving, right? We make that decision in our hearts and minds, if we be honest about it, right? Um, we're talking about believers now. Um, but it's interesting to note that here the Lord said that uh, by reminding them that this will be how they will know by your acts of love toward one another, this commandment, <laughs> this is the mark of discipleship. This is how they will know that you are born again. That This is how they know that you are a true disciple. Yes. And so, you know, it just reminds us sometimes that um, – that that's just that's the qualifier. It's a command from the Lord, and so oftentimes we encounter each other with our different uh, personalities and um, all the other baggage. Sometimes we've gone through or the conflicts we've had um, in our own lives. Um, sometimes internally, sometimes with others. Sometimes we cast them into a role of less loving, um, or they're difficult to deal with, um, and and so there there really isn't a line to draw in the sand. Um, we are to love one another, um, and by that, that's the true mark of a disciple. It's just that simple. There are no other options. No other options. But I think it's interesting, friends, that you can have people with Christian labels and Christian titles who don't act loving, and the world will say, yeah, you have a Christian title, but you're not demonstrating that you've been with Christ. You have non-Christians who will say that. Yeah, okay, you're a pastor, you're a bishop, you're supposed to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Even folks that don't know the Lord at all, mm -hmm. at least they know yes. that Christians are supposed to be loving people. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Listen, friends, this is a direct mm -hmm. imperative from the Lord bold, himself. Yeah, it's bold and it's very clear. It's very clear. Yeah. It's very clear. Just like I have loved you with no strings attached. Yeah. I just love you mm -hmm. with no string, no reason. Yeah. And, and everything that we argued about, mm -hmm. I'm dropping it because it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. What's more important mm -hmm. is that we come together and love and unity and figure out the best way to use our gifts and talents together as a team, mm -hmm. expanding God's kingdom and making a difference in our city and helping these new disciples grow. If we're talking about a, a, a in church setting, let me give you an example, friends, something that we see so often. The example I would use is that we find <laughs> as it, as interesting, a, um, uh, I've seen this multiple times. A young pastor comes on the scene. He's 28, 30, early 30s. Um, a young pastor full of ideas, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, full of energy. And, and, and he just gets installed. Mm -hmm. And I remember speaking to a young pastor. He was, At that time, he was, about, he was in his late 30s, so he wasn't that, that young. Mm -hmm. And, and and he he was telling me he said Julius what they told me when I he said young man we's the deacons and since we's the deacons we gonna keep things in order around here and 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 then there began a power struggle mm -hmm. oftentimes in churches because you have a maybe you have a couple families that are influential because they give a lot of money. Or maybe you have a few families there who are friends with the founder or mm -hmm. they've been there since the church was started or their mm -hmm. friends mm -hmm. real tight knit with the pastor or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they have their own private agenda that may not necessarily be kingdom expansion. Yes. But it's my agenda. It's what I want. It's what I desire because it's simply what I want. And. You, sir, pastor, are not going to disrupt our agenda. You ain't going to be bringing that new music in here. 
and you ain't gonna be do I've never remember I was playing for a group one time and I was playing bass for a group mm-hmm. and there was a young man we were singing a song the presence of the Lord is here the presence of the Lord is here I feel it in the atmosphere everyone knows that song we're playing that song and it was a young man uh, that was that was leading the song and his, his he something happened this one time we did this song we had done it multiple times but this one time he did this song we were at Ray of Hope Baptist maybe I shouldn't have said the name of the church Ray of Hope Baptist Pastor Franklin was the pastor and and he just got full of energy and full of joy this one time and he just got so excited and he said i can feel the presence of the lord and i'm gonna you know get my blessing right now and he's just singing it he's excited and the crowd is getting excited mm-hmm. and there was a group of old deacons on the side who just wasn't gonna have it mm-hmm. and there was no greater joy but to see this young man mm-hmm. To get excited about the things of God, he's operating in the kingdom, he's singing this song, I mean, it's it's just, there's an emotional feeling happening, and you know, and it's just, and people are having fun, there's about three or four hundred people in this service, and and then after he, after he finishes that song, the deacons walk over to him and say, we don't do that here, I'm sorry, we don't do that here, and once... The service was over. I saw him with a tear coming down his face. And I had uh, asked my, my, my brother Devon, who was playing drums at the time. I said, Devon, what, what's, what's going on with him? And I had not gone to talk to him. And he said, they told him that he can't, he can't do that. He can't do what? You, you can't have energy. You can't, mm. you know, you, you can't actually enjoy having fun in the Lord's house. And to see that young man's heart get broke and smashed and his spirit crushed. Because all those old deacons knew was this is the way we always do it here. And you're not going to be the one to come in here and do something different. And that's one of those instances, friends, where there was no love shown. There was no love received. Mm -hmm. The deacons seemed to be more concerned about just keeping things the way they had always known it. Wow. Much more than they were concerned about seeing the young people pick up the mantle of the ministry and run forward with it. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately we need to consider um, that there is a new generation that the Lord is raising up or the Lord is trying to raise up. Who will take the helm and move forward in ministry? I was speaking with a great statesman, a great statesman um, of the ministry right here in, mm-hmm. in in our area. I was sitting in his house, and he was saying, "You know what, Julius?" And if I said his name, most of the people would know. I was. This was about three weeks ago. I told my wife, I said, "Hey, I met that pastor," and we were talking. We had a really good conversation. And he said, and he almost had a tear in his eye. He said, look, I'm 75 years old. And I've been preaching this gospel for 40 years. And me and my wife, we've been serving the Lord for 30 some years. We've been pastoring. Yes. I am ready to turn it over to the young people. And for years I fought it. But now I realize it's time to turn this thing over to the young people. Mm-hmm. Because if I don't turn it over to the young people, the ministry will be eventually begin to die. I need to anoint these young people, lay hands on them and start training them and then release them and let them go. Mm-hmm. But yet it's wise, but it's also an act of love. Mm-hmm. Because as these young people are looking at the previous generation. They're looking at them with awe and respect. Mm-hmm. They don't want to be rejected by you. <laughs> They want you to codify their ministry and to concretize their ministry. And they need your stamp of approval before they'll get confidence to try Mm -hmm. as you push them forward. And that's exactly what Jesus did to the disciples. Mm -hmm. He taught them. He trained them. He anointed them. And at some point he said, look, fellas, I'm not going to always be with you. You're going to have to carry this thing on. 
Okay, love. Let's look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. What do we have? Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love. Comfort from his love, the if, love of Christ. If any common sharing in the spirit. Common sharing in the spirit. If any tenderness and compassion. Listen, friends. Then make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. By being like And be like this. Having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. This is word, friends. Do nothing out, out of, of vain glory or selfish ambition. ambition or selfish motives. Look at how many things we do in the body of Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the covers off. Well, look at how many things we do in the body of Christ. How much so-called, as I put in air quotes because it's the word that we use, how much so-called ministry we do out of selfish ambition and vainglory and our own personal motives and agendas. When this verse in Philippians chapter 2 and verse, what was that, verse 3? Yes. Don't do anything out of those side motives. Or vain conceit. Or vain conceit. Rather in humility. Humility. Go through to verse 11. All the way through. No, just read okay. it all the way straight on down. All right. So, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility. Humility. Listen, you. friends. Humility. I don't care what the world is saying. The world wants to flaunt and the world wants to flex. Yes. I'm going to... I got it and I know it and I'm going to shake it. I'm going to put it on display and I'm going to make you think that I'm a legend in your mind because for, you know, you know, I'm concerned about my image and the way you view me. But how many know as believers in the body of Christ, humility is looked at as a virtue. Rather, in humility, humility value others, value above, others yourself. above yourself. Not looking to your own interest. Not looking to your own interest. Deacon, pastor, uh, chairman of the deacon board. Watch this. Watch this. First lady. Minister of music, youth pastor, whatever your title is. We should have a tremendous drive and a seeking towards what is God's will, not your own will. And here's the key. When you think more highly of yourself than you ought to, then you think that your opinion and your agenda should be the primary thing. Why? Because you think more highly of yourself than you ought to. I'm taking the covers off. It's uncovered. There it is. It's been exposed. Mm. You got side motives and you got side agendas. And a part of the big reason why we have so much conflict and so much tiff and rift and foolishness and argument and division in the body of Christ is because everyone wants to exalt themselves and exalt and promote their agendas. But when will we move forward in love together, understanding that none of our agendas matter? Mm -hmm. What matters is growing God's kingdom and making disciples. And we do it together in humility yes. and in love. Read a little bit more. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Interest of the others. Philippians 2 verse 5. In your own relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being hmm. in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something, something to be to grasped be used at. To his own advantage. Wow. Wow. Ho, 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 ho. Wait a minute. 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 Jesus Christ is divine in essence. Mm. Okay. I mean, he's, he's 
the essence of what divinity is, Jesus Christ is that. So in a, in, he is essentially God. Mm-hmm. In Philippians, excuse me, Colossians chapter 1 around verse 16. In John chapter 1, mm-hmm. he is God. Mm-hmm. If you took a human body mm-hmm. and placed God in it, Inside of a human body to animate that body. Mm -hmm. There's no other name you could give it but Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. But listen, this is God in a body. Mm -hmm. Yet, the word says in Philippians that Jesus Christ is God in a body. Yet, the authority and the power that he has as God. He never even used that as a point through which he should manipulate people. To his advantage. But he never used it to his advantage. I think Matthew 17, um, 24 uh, really is a good example of that um, where they had come to Capernaum um, mm-hmm. and uh, the they were talking about the temple tax and they approached Peter yes. and said, does uh-huh. your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter said yes, abruptly. And when they had come to the, to the <laughs> house and uh, the Lord asked him a question, Tuesday. now who do you think they collect the taxes from strangers or their own sons. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, well, from strangers. And Jesus said, yes, because the sons are free. But nonetheless, lest we offend them, go cast a hook, take the fish that comes up first, open its mouth, mouth and and there you'll find a piece of money. That's it. And then take and go it pay your taxes. and go pay the taxes for me and you. That's it. So in other words, I'm sorry. I'm going to let you make your <laughs> point. But this is so powerful. And it's right on point with Philippians. Go ahead. Re- right. Make so your it, point. It make your right point. point. So, so the sons are free. So he's the son of God. And he is God. And so here they're commanding or asking, uh, trying to put a yoke of bondage on him about paying temple tax. But he said, lest I offend them. Lest I offend them. I will submit to what it is that they're doing while I'm in their presence. So even though he being uh, in the very nature of God, he did not consider that equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, being subject to the human traditions of man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was very powerful. Um, he taught so many lessons just in that one example. Um, obviously, he had predicted his death. He had done so many powerful miracles leading up to that point. But yet he made himself subject. Mm-hmm. as not to take advantage of his very nature being God. And not wanting to give man anything they could use to cast a spurge. Yes, that's it. That's anything they could that's use to distort um, his validity, mm-hmm. his reputation. That's right. So I thought that was a very powerful example that was very fitting with Philippians uh, verses uh, yeah, 5 through 11. That's right. So Jesus made it his point, and he made provisions even for Peter, mm-hmm. that no one's going to point a finger at us. We're going to pay the same tax that everybody else is paying. Yes. Go get that fish, mm-hmm. take the coin out of his mouth, and yes. let's go pay our taxes. Because yes. that's just the way we yes. do it. And even in, just in that, the, the whole provision of the money being in the fish's belly. <laughs> just him demonstrating his, his, his deity. But yes, yet, that is deity. But yet, he said, just go pay the taxes. <laughs> Oh, that's deep. Listen, friends, God loves relationships. Mm-hmm. He loves relationships with people. Mm-hmm. And then now here's what I, I mean. He wants to have relationships with people. Mm-hmm. And he loves to see people have at least decent relationships with each other. Yes. And he would prefer that his People have yes. great relationships yes. with each other. Are we finishing Philip? Uh, did we go down to chapter verse eleven? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Let, let's go. Let's get down to verse eleven. All right. And being found in the appearance as a man, 
passes, verse 8. Humility now. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. This is the mind that we need to have. If you remember earlier in the passage, she was saying, this is the way that I need you to start thinking. This brings joy to my heart when you humble yourself and when you love each other. Mm -hmm. God has given him, has exalted him and given him a name which yes. is above every name. That, that at the name yes. of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess of all things under heaven and on earth and above the earth. Mm -hmm. Listen, friends. That's telling me something. Jesus was exalted, mm -hmm. as we just read in verses 9, 10, and 11. Mm -hmm. Why was he exalted? He exalted because, it, says, it actually says, wherefore God has highly exalted him. Why? Why did he get exalted? Because he humbled himself first. And because he got exalted, the fact that he was exalted doesn't mean that you go around in conceit and arrogance wielding power everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if he was going to walk around in conceit and arrogance wielding power everywhere, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have got exalted. Mm -hmm. You figure this is God in a body humbling himself. We got a lot of young potential church leaders with a lot of potential who doesn't understand the value and the virtue of humility. Yes. So that way, when you get exalted too fast, that's the reason why it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, not a novice. As if a man desired to offer to be, a, if a yes. man desired the office of a bishop, he desired good works, let him him first be blameless. Mm -hmm. And it goes all the way down, not a novice. Unless he be lifted up with pride and fall into a snare and the condemnation of the devil. That's what the word says. This is why I want to say to pastors and elders and potential pastors and elders and church leaders for the future. You don't need to be exalted too fast. I'm sorry. You just don't. Because the word bears that out. Because God does not want his people filled with pride. He wants people filled with humility. Listen, friends, if you have goals in the Lord and you feel like the Lord has laid something on your heart that you're going to do a great work for him, the fastest way up is to go down. Mm -hmm. Step on the elevator of God's kingdom and press the lowest button you can press, possibly press. And when you press that button, the lowest number that you can possibly press, then God will take yeah. you higher. Yeah, and, and Oftentimes we can take ourselves higher and right. make a big mess of things, yeah. even though we might make money in the process or our names might get famous in the process. Mm -hmm. You're out of God's will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, as I think uh, about uh, Matthew 17 and when he said, lest we offend them, um, motivated him to humility and to use wisdom and how he dealt with them. And so, again, you know, he demonstrated that, you know, he was God, that all creation obeys him. The first fish that Peter took out had the coins in his belly yes. to pay the taxes. Yes. So he demonstrated that he was the, the rightful son of God already. Mm -hmm. I mean, even leading up to that, <laughs> um, casting out demons and, um, you know, the Mount of and, Transfiguration. And, and, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so at this point, um, dealing with... Uh, what some might seem petty <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> might seem petty um, but they wanted the temple tax to be paid um, and so they asked Peter and Peter abruptly said yes um, and the Lord knew and but what motivated him is that he said love obviously but lest we offend them yes that's right he employed humility he demonstrated humility and wisdom that's it that's right. And so, you know, sometimes we just have to count the cost 
Um, and, and sometimes we have to sacrifice and sometimes we have to submit. And sometimes we have to take a, uh, you know, the low road or the high road um, and, you know, be willing to demonstrate humility, count the cost of disunity. Um, and, that, and remember that we have an adversary. Um, that wants to triumph over God's people and to to disrupt and cause us to abort God's p- purpose and plan for our lives and fight each other um, and fight each other. And I get it. There there are lots of things that are happening um, before our eyes, uh, you know, globally in our communities in our churches. Um, you know, the world tells us that we need to appreciate diversity, but yet the Bible is emphatic. It's emphatic. It emphasizes unity in the body, um, but the world tells us diversity. You know, we need to accept that and appreciate that, um, and we need to honor that. But the word has a different um, position when it comes to that. And so we just need to be careful that we are not, uh, uh, we don't accept the fact that uh, divisions and favoritism and jealousy and bitterness um, is existing and thriving in the house of God. And, and don't, and you do not allow yourself to think that that's normal. Yes. Like you were saying, bitterness and division and jealousy and Mm -hmm. and tension and cliques. That's not normal. That conflict, that's not normal. And it doesn't belong with God's people. Did you have anything else you wanted to say on that? Okay. Listen, friends, there are 59 passages in the word of God Mm -hmm. that talk about Christians' relationships with each other. Excuse me, not the word of God, the New Testament. Mm Mm-hmm. 59 passages in the New Testament that talk about God's people having relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. Listen, 59 passages, there's only about four passages in the New Testament that talk about money. There's only two passages in the whole entire New Testament that talk about tithing. Mm -hmm. One Matthew said you give your mint, a knees, and cumin. That's not talking about money, but it is talking about tithing. Hebrews chapter 9, Melchizedek gave a, excuse me, Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, which was the spoils of war in Hebrews chapter 9. That's not Mm -hmm. talking about money. Yet we spend far more time in our churches talking about money and tithing than we do about relationships. Mm -hmm. When Jesus was much more concerned about relationships and the apostles were more concerned about relationships. 59 passages in the New Testament. We're just going to touch on some. Feel free to chime in whenever you want. If something floats your boat or the spirit speaks and rises up. We're just going to touch on a few for the last five or eight minutes. 59 passages that talk about relationships. Listen. Mark chapter 9 and verse 50. Be at peace with one another. Look at this. John chapter 15 and verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Because he said that twice with only one chapter in between. So in chapter 13, he's talking about love. Mm -hmm. And then chapter 15, he's saying, I command you to love one another. This is how the Lord wants our relationships to go. 59 passages. Listen, listen here. John chapter, no, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans chapter 12 and verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Romans chapter 15 and verse 7. Accept one another. Just as Christ accepted you. You hear this? This is relationship. This is, and and it's not, it's good relationship. (laughs) These are good relationship verses. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 20. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Serve one another in love. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2.
carry each other's burdens. Mm -hmm. wow. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. <laughs> Did you hear that? It's on Facebook. You can rewind it. <laughs> this is strong. Yes. This is strong. Listen, listen here. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2. You didn't know this was in here, did you? Be completely humble mm. and gentle. And that's talking about all Christians. Mm. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Relationship verses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at this. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. Just as Christ. Just as in Christ. God has forgiven you. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yeah. Powerful. Powerful. Very powerful. Powerful. Look at this. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Speak to one another with songs mm -hmm. and hymns and spiritual songs. Can you imagine two Christians meeting on the street and they both realize the other one a Christian and they both just start singing praise songs? <laughs> wow. But, but the Lord has a lot to say about relationships. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse, th verse 18 Comfort one another mm -hmm. with these words. What words? Now, First Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about the rapture. Whether you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture or a mid-tribulation rapture or just a single second coming, second yeah. advent. However it is that you interpret that eschatological, either way, it's words of comfort. Yeah. Look, at, look at this right, right here. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11. Encourage one another <laughs> and yeah. build up each other. First Thessalonians 5 and th verse 13. Live in peace with one another. This is how Christians ought to act towards each other. Powerful verses. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 3. Encourage one another. Yes. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Can I can I share just for a minute? You know, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, we talked about, my husband and I had the pleasure of going to Spain a few weeks ago, and it was a phenomenal trip. It was beautiful. Uh, we uh, were celebrating um, early our anniversary, our mm -hmm. 25th anniversary, so um, we chose to take an international trip. And we were cruising, and we were in Barcelona, and in, in, um, in France, and um, Rome, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful time together. And my husband, for those of you who don't know him personally, he is a Marvel fan. Uh, he loves comic books. Um, he loves superhero movies. Um, and so we watched Black Panther again. <laughs> So, yes, we saw when it first came out. Amen. Um, we probably have seen it several times. I've lost track of how and many Thor, times we've seen Thor, it. And Thor Ragnarok. And so we watched it again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny because it's so much more than just a superhero movie. We talked about that, him and I, as we were compar comparing notes. Um, there's so many themes and ideas there in that movie. I mean, yes, you know, it's two hours of fun, of cinema. We can um, just kind of kick back and ignore the, ignore the problems that are happening in the world. Um, and, you know, in our recliner chairs, popcorn and drink and watch this movie. Um, and there were lots of cultural um, things in this movie. Um, obviously, the most prevalent being that um, the rich culture that um, has been brought to the United States um, by African that has been widely underappreciated over time. Mm -hmm. So that obviously was one of the prevalent themes in the movie. Mm -hmm. And of course, Wakanda was beautiful. Um, and there was this action, you know, the sequence of action and sci-fi gadgets. Um, there was humor, but there was two other things. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there was this, you know, black power and there was females who were in power. But there was something else, I think, too, that really um, gripped me in that movie, and that was its message of unity, but of also disunity. And yes, so one of, my, right. one of my favorite scenes in that movie, it just every time I see it, it my jaw just drops, is, is when they, the kingdom had, they were divided, 
and they yes, were fighting, right. fighting each other. Each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they were dueling, they were battling, and it was no holes bar. And two of them were cousins. And 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 two were cousins, uh, lifelong friends, and you know, um, relatives. Um, brothers and sisters and whatever side of the fence or position they were on, they were dueling for their cause, for their purpose, um, for their will. Um, and, you know, uh, Wakabi um, had yes. brought out, you know, the, the meadow rhinoceros, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that was supposed to be, I guess, like the uh, to end this battle once and for all. And um so so during that that course of the the sequence of events um i believe it was him and his wife mm-hmm. came to a point where they had this confrontation and you know he questioned her loyalty to him or to wakanda um and then he looked around and he saw the evidence the dismay the chaos in the kingdom how far they had fallen from their purpose in their plan, in their greatness, and in vision, and they were fighting and quarreling and destroying each other mm-hmm. in this scene. Wow! And so it was just it was just very uh, wow. sobering to look at that when you looked around. They were just battling, and we actually said to each other, "This looks like the church killing their own, destroying their own." And so you all know the story. You've seen the movie, so you know how it unfolds. And so, you know, he basically succeeds. He basically throws in the, you know, the white towel. Um, he surrenders. And, of course, his, those, his army and those who are supporting him also give in. Um, but there's a lot of chaos in between. A lot of bloodshed. Um, a lot of bloodshed unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, they they kind of put their guards down um, when they should be uh, still holding up, you know, the weapons against the real enemy. Um, they're fighting amongst each other now. Yes. And so very powerful, more than just a, a Marvel movie. I thought it had some great elements, um, some very cultural and spiritual significance. Um, and so we need to stop and ponder uh, where are we, um, you know, in, in this plan, in this process. Are we part of the ones that are fighting with our brothers and sisters or fighting against them? Um, and we need to, to really take that to heart and ask the Lord to really help us search our hearts um, to make sure that we're, whose side are we really on? Um, so, you know, it has come to the end of uh, the broadcast, and we thank you so very much for uh, tuning in with us each week. Yep. Um, whether this is your first time or you've been with us um, following along uh, with the broadcast, we thank you so much for allowing us to come into your hearts and your homes and your vehicles um, to share the word with you, um, mm-hmm. to share what the Lord has been giving us. Um, and we just pray that you will continue to pray for us and continue to join us um, as we continue to unfold this topic of unity and explore other uh, topics the Lord lays on our heart. Um, and again, we thank you uh, for being with us. We thank you just for the opportunity. You know, it's, it's funny how life has unfolded and we're able to come across cyberspace uh, to share the good news with you um, and hoping that this will reach um, international borders as well. Um, and so on, on that note, we thank you, we love you, and we appreciate you tuning in. Um, and until next week, uh, we'll talk to you again on the Just Word Show. One more verse. You know, I love one these, more verse. <laughs> one more verse. You know, I love these verses. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. Love one another deeply from the heart. Yes. That's it. Say it again. Say it love again. Love one another deeply from the heart. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. Amen.